Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome John Mackey and Erwin Miller back to our series. We also invite you to visit our YouTube channel for over 300 conversations like this. Today we talk about John's book, Conscious Leadership, Elevating Humanity Through Business. John Mackey is the CEO and co-founder of Whole Foods Market, co-founder of the nonprofit Conscious Capitalism, Inc., and co-author of Conscious Capitalism. He has devoted his life to selling natural and organic foods and building a better business model. Erwin Miller is a principal and design director at Gensler. He has served as a firm-wide lifestyle leader in the global retail practice and a studio director, and is currently leads the museum and culture practice. Welcome again to both of you, and I'm going to let Erwin take it from here. Great. Good to see you, John. I was mentioning uh, way back when I did an intro for John when he had his last book around. So it's good to see you again on screen. Good uh, to see you too, Erwin. Welcome. So I love the book. I, I read through it, and you're going to find I read through these things in, in high detail. So I'll have some hard-hitting questions. Hopefully, they get to the depths of what you shared. It was just a, it's a great read, and I think this book is, is going to do great. I'm as good as the questions people ask. <laughs> Perfect. Good. I usually get some support on that. So let's see how it goes. Well, you start early on with a question, um, a story about Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address, the conciseness of his speech, that it was the sort of well-articulated message that the nation needed at that time, that every leader must work towards and speak to a higher purpose. Can you talk to us about this higher purpose and what it means? I mean, I think people understand higher purpose in the nonprofit sector of our society. If you think about nonprofit organizations, they're all purpose driven. So the Humane Society of the United States trying to help animals, their higher purpose is um, celebrating animals and confronting cruelty. We know the Nature Conservancy is trying to conserve the Earth's wild places. We know that um, Doctors Without Borders is trying to give medical care around the world in places that uh, have great need of it. So the nonprofits, the purpose element seems very clear to people. But what's, what's confused people about business is the narrative about business is that it's all about money. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that the purpose of business, if you ask people what the purpose of business is at a, at a cocktail party, random people, they'll, they'll look at you kind of quizzically and they'll say, well, what do you mean? What's the purpose of business? Purpose of business to make money, right? That's an odd answer because if you ask what the purpose of a doctor is, they make a lot of money, but it's to heal people. If you ask the question what the purpose of a teacher is, it's to educate. If you ask the purpose of an architect, they design buildings, engineers construct things. Every one of the professions refers back to some type of value creation for other people. And here's the thing, business is the greatest value creator in the world for other people. That's what it does. It creates value. It creates far more value than all the nonprofits and all the governments combined. And yet it's put in this very unflattering box that it's just about the money. So the higher purpose of a business will tie back into the value creation it's doing in the world. Whole Foods Market's higher purpose is to nourish people on the planet. Google's higher purpose is to organize the world's information and make it readily accessible. Amazon's higher purpose is to be the Earth's most customer-centric organization. So businesses, particularly the, some of the businesses we most admire in the world, they all tend to have a higher purpose. It's just the narrative is not told about it. And, and it, because the narrative becomes, uh, it's just about money. And uh, part of that comes from the enemies of business who don't think business is good, but part of it's business themselves falling back on the, yeah, I'm just make money. So I think the first thing about higher purpose is we have to, we have to realize that if I go into Whole Foods and do an orientation and say, Hey, welcome to Whole Foods. So glad you're here. While you're here, your, your job is to maximize profits for the owners of the business. Yeah. Anybody have a problem with that? You're, you're not going to get the, you're not going to get the people aren't going to, they're not going to care as much about that. And, and that and business is about creating value for its customers. Ultimately, it's always about creating value for the customers in some form or fashion. So it's determining the value creation, hence at what that higher purpose can be. And a higher purpose organizes the business. It, it helps orientate the business, the team members, 
everybody can understand, all the stakeholders can identify with a, with a higher purpose. And so business like a nonprofit should focus on its higher purpose, its mission. So I love that. And it, I mean, it starts, it starts early, right? You say, you, you comment about Roy Spence who says, don't ask kids what they want to do when they grow up. Ask, ask them what they love to do. And I'm from that generation, you know, from 68, where just you were always asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? What was the job? What was going to pay the bills? Um, so changing that mindset. Yeah, Erwin, we're so fascinating about the Gettysburg Address. I mean, besides, it's, it's yeah. incredibly beautiful to read Precision. it and listen, and listen to it even better. But we're in this great civil war, right? We, the United States is divided into warring states with different philosophies about the nation. And, and, uh, and it's very difficult. A lot of people are being killed and there's a lot of suffering. And, and, uh, and in a lot of ways, Lincoln tried in the Gettysburg Address, and, and I think he did a really effective job of it, of trying to articulate what he believed the higher purpose of America was, the higher purpose of the United States. And I think that's what makes that such a powerful speech. And purposes tend to evolve over time, but I believe that Lincoln did catch part of the higher purpose of America, and particularly at the very end when it's, you know, so that the, the government that's of the people and for the people will not perish from this earth. It's pretty powerful. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And, you know, it leads right into this idea of evolution you talk about next. Um, and I, I turned 50 recently and or a couple of years ago, and I started to think as a leader, it's understanding the evolution you go through as life. Um, you say sometimes we need to walk through the wilderness to find a sense of direction. Um, as someone who's clearly evolved since starting Whole Foods, um, I wonder what's, a, what's important about this idea of evolving, because I've read your last book, I've read this book, and the stories in between show you're on a different journey. What can you share with people about, about how your book's going to help them with that idea of that journey and how we evolve as leaders? <clears throat> Well, the entire book, first of all, let's just talk about most business leaders in general yeah. to put it in perspective. And most business leaders are, they're mostly extroverts. They tend to be very task oriented. It's not unusual. You'll have a very densely, you'll have a schedule that goes from meeting to meeting that uh, have you have a ton of tasks that you've got to get done. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. And so you're very, it's, there's a reason why it's called business, busyness, because there's this, um, you, you're going, 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 going all the time. But to develop as a conscious leader, that's, a, most of that is about sort of inner development, something that business people frequently neglect. You have to do, it's know thyself. You have to, you have to do this inner work. Love, we put it out as we think of it as an emotion, but we're going to argue in this book, or we do argue in this book, there's more of a skill or a set of skills that we develop and that we can do it in a conscious way. Integrity has not come natural to human beings. From the moment children learn how to talk, they learn how to lie and they begin to tell lies at a very young age and they become very skilled at it. So becoming truthful and honest, trustworthy, trying to do the right thing, uh, that's a skill set. We have to work at it. We have to develop it. But we don't think in terms of win, win, win solutions. We generally think in terms of win, lose. That's kind of the paradigm that most people operate from. So we have to do this inner work. And, you know, we need conscious leaders so badly right now. We need tens of thousands of them, hundreds of thousands in America. We are, we're at our throats. It's again, I, I use, we talked about Lincoln and Gettysburg address, but yeah. this is probably the most divided Americans have ever been since the civil war. And I don't see very many conscious leaders. I don't see very many people trying to lead with love. I don't see very much trying to find win-win-win solutions. I don't always see a lot of integrity. I see just the opposite. Uh, and so we need conscious leaders in business, but we also need them in politics. We need them in government. We need them in the education system. We need them in our healthcare system. We need them in the military. We need conscious leaders. And this book is about how to develop yourself as a conscious leader. It's a book of practices. We have every, every chapter has practices that we can do to get, to get more aware, more conscious and develop ourselves. You know, Malcolm Gladwell, I think was the one that sort of made famous the, uh, the idea that you got to do 10,000 hours. You want to master something, you got to spend 10,000 hours on it. Yeah. Hey, if you want to, if you want to master conscious leadership, 
is going to take you 10,000 hours or more. You have to focus on it. You have to work at it. It's not something that automatically happens. Yeah, I mean, that kind of awareness is so important. So two thoughts about inspiration, and then I want to talk about love, because that's something I didn't see coming in this book. And, and when you get into love, it's really, it's really strong, and I think that'll define kind of this direction for this book that people weren't expecting to see in a kind of a business book in this sort. Um, so you, you have this quote you shared from a, from a writer whose name I will not pronounce well, so I will not say it. But if you want to build a ship, don't drum up men and women to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast um, and endless sea. And you share a great story about Kennedy you can share there. But that level of leadership, um, how do you instill that in others and, and, and own that higher purpose so you're bringing it back to your teams to kind of inspire, inspire them to move forward? Here's the thing. As we all know, we pay a lot more attention to what people do and who they are than what they say. So if, we want, if you want to instill purpose in your organization, you have to embody that purpose yourself. You have to, as Gandhi said, you, want, you have to be the change that you wish to see in the world. You have to be the purpose that you wish to see in your organization. You have to manifest that purpose. And if you do, then people are gonna be attracted to it because people with purpose have passion and passion attracts people to it. And it helps, it's like, imagine if you think a fire is burning, if the fire is really hot, it will ignite wood that's nearby yeah. it Jason, yeah. and when we are passionate about purpose we ignite that purpose in other people's hearts and minds we awaken it inside of them so that's one thing a leader does if you want to instill purpose in the organization you have to sort of be that purpose you have to ignite it in others that being said in, a, in an organization people are unless you keep purpose in the forefront unless you if you just write it down and stick it on a wall someplace, it's just gonna, you know, it's gonna be a wall decoration. It's not gonna yep. be a living. People are gonna forget about it. Plus, you're always hiring new people who may not know your purpose. So you, so you have to constantly talk about it. You have to tie it back into the actions that the company's making and show, you have to show how, what we're doing is consistent with our higher purpose. I'm con I always talk about higher purpose. I'm always explaining it. I'm always talking about Whole Foods' core values and our leadership principles and how this fits into those. And so I, I lead by example in that regard. But we, we also put the whole purpose into the, um, into the orientation of new people. And we have something new that we started in the last year called Cultural Champions at Whole Foods. We actually encourage our team members to go through a program to get certified as a, as a Whole Foods cultural champion and purpose and mission and our core values is all in there. So people have to learn that and they, and they get certified in it. So we take it very seriously because purpose is easily neglected and forgotten. And unless you are always keeping the fire hot, it's gonna burn out. Well, that's, I mean, that's the part that, you know, business leaders need to understand, I think you say is that it's embedded in the human nature to want this purpose, right? There's that story of, of Kennedy going up to the Jenner and saying he's walking through NASA before we went to the moon and said, what do you do here? He said, I'm helping put a man on the moon. And that's, and that's an innate nature of someone wants that. So it's, it's up to us to drive that for people. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, uh, I'm going to connect it now a little bit to lead with love, but we're, we'll yeah. we get back to that. But I'm just going to say that the two things that I found if you want people to stay with your organization, if you want people to work with you for years and years and years and decades and decades, like they have with Whole Foods, we have one of the first things Amazon commented about when they got to know Whole Foods after our merger was, you sure have a lot of people that have worked here a long time. How do you do that? And I hadn't really thought about it before, but then I began to think about it and I began to realize there were two main reasons people stay with Whole Foods for many, 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 many years. The first one is purpose. We help people see that their work is, that what they're doing, selling natural and organic and healthy foods to people is, it's helping people live a healthier lifestyle. They feel good about that. And they're contributing to uh, that, uh, to helping people to be healthier. And also the kind of stores that we create and the way people can serve them, they're also helping people to, to be happier. So nourishing you know, our high purpose is to nourish people on the planet. And nourish is a great word because you also nourish people physically, but you can also nourish them emotionally and spiritually as well. 
And the second thing is, is people want to be cared about. People want to be loved. And if you give people purpose and love, they never will want to leave. I mean, because those are the things people want the most. We want to have a sense that our life is making a difference. And we want to feel that people care about us, that, that, they're hap- they're, they're, that they know who we are and that they're glad that we're here and that somebody loves us. And most organizations meet neither one of those needs. And so people aren't really fulfilled in their work. So we, we focus on those two areas. And, and I think that's why people stick around Whole Foods for so long. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, there's a level of trust you have to have when you can welcome that love and that kind of compassion and understanding. So you say, uh, first you, you start with this quote by Steve Farber, who says, love is just good damn business. And, um, and you say, humans are also creatures, creatures of elevated emotion, artistic imagination, joy, laughter, and leaps of faith. I think one of the things, um, you know, we're in strange times, you brought it up, is we're all trying to stay connected in different ways. But what we're finding is the organizations that are really doing well were the ones that had those roots before COVID hit, before six months ago, they had to maybe not be connected. Um, you know, those connections really tie people together, don't they? Yeah, it's interesting you bring it up because people always say, you know, are, we gonna, are people going to continue to work remotely when this thing is over? And the answer is yes, probably more than they did pre-COVID. But right. you, cannot, you cannot maintain an organizational culture strictly working remotely. You, people have got to be together in person. There's this connection. We're tribal animals. We need to be not just talking to the tribe on video. We got to be. We got to be in people's presence. And we, in other words, social distancing will come to an end. I promise you, because people want to be close to each other. And so I say, like now, Whole Foods, we have a very good culture, and we made cultural deposits for for many, many, many years, decades, in fact. But COVID has been, we're, we're, there's cultural withdrawals now. We are, because um, we're not able to connect to people the same way we could, and they're not able to connect with each other the same way they could because of social distancing. Nobody's hugging, no handshaking. Uh, and if that was to go on indefinitely, even Whole Foods Market, the, the bonds that people have, they start to fray and start to split apart. So I'm very conscious that I can see it happening a little bit already but we still have great solidarity from all of the, uh, all of the time that we made deposits in the, in the goodwill bank, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, you started to see, um, I remember early on, it was more people on my Zoom calls with my teams and all everyone was sharing stories about going for walks and getting out with their family and things they just didn't do. So it was a nice way to bring us back to that, but I'm not sure the laziness right now is that everyone's just had enough. It's that our human nature is guiding us to that tribal instinct of we sort of want to be together and stick together and get within more of six feet than each other. So we do. And and that's warring with people's fear of not wanting to get infected. Right. So uh, that's why we have to move towards, we have to move to a post COVID state where people begin to feel safe again, some kind of, herd immunity, whether that's just because it's the virus has burned itself out by working through the population or through vaccination or a combination of the two. So you shared, you know, throughout the story, throughout the book, you just have great stories you've shared of other business leaders and what, what drove them, how they grew, how they became these conscientious leaders. I love the story about, um, about Jonathan Keyser from Phoenix uh, and in real estate, this idea of hunting versus nurturing a crop. Can you share that story of, of that? Yeah, I'm happy to show, share that story because Jonathan Kaiser is a really good friend of mine. Yeah. And, and Jonathan, real estate, the paradigm of real estate is, is, is cutthroat. You know, it's a cutthroat business where you, you don't trust anybody. You're just, and so and when Jonathan was looking for a better way, he met a guy that uh, I, 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 he's kept that identity secret to me, but I think I know who it is. <laughs> I think it's I think it's Adam Grant who wrote a great book called Give and Take, and uh, uh, and he he I think whoever it was explained to Jonathan, hey, in your business, you're basically looking for to find clients one at a time. You're out hunting for them. You 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 kill the you get the client, you you have a transaction with them, and then you know the next day you got to go out hunting again and find another client to have a transaction with. And he said. What you should think about doing is farming. 
where you plant a lot of seeds and you nurture them and uh, over time those grow and you you have trees that are producing a lot of fruit for you and more fruit than you can eat and it's a pretty good metaphor because what he's really saying is if you will give more if you will if you will nurture people and you will take care of them that human nature being what it is reciprocity develops over time and people will remember the generosity and the kindnesses you did for them and they will reciprocate them. And the reason people don't tend to do that and they do hunting and real estate say is that it takes more time. There's a lag period. People don't immediately, they, you, somebody does you a favor, you think, you know, what are they up to? What do they want? They're, you're thinking they're gonna come back and ask me, they did, they took me to dinner and now they're gonna ask me to donate $10,000 to their, whatever their cause is. It's like, that's not really a good exchange, right? So you, you tend to be a little bit suspicious of people that are doing favors for you initially, but then as you develop trust over time, as you just, as you decide they're not really looking for anything back except for friendship, um, then you develop more trust and you'll be more inclined to be generous in return. And so Jonathan built his business model about around that. And he's got, now he's got the most successful commercial real estate brokerage firm in Arizona and growing and growing in other parts of the country now. So that, that can work, that philosophy can work in real estate. If you can work in real estate, I think it can work in just about any type of business. But it, it means you're investing and you're thinking long-term and you're, 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 you're investing in relationships. You're not looking to get anything back. It's just that you're counting on the fact that human beings, mostly we are kind people that will reciprocate kindness back when we receive it in and, and so and that's proven to be true for him and and more if more people in business realize that we'd have a very we'd have a different world that that uh so i, I like the i like the farming versus the hunting metaphor i think it's appropriate yeah i mean it also translates directly right after that we are talking about how that comes to your teams this whole idea of appreciation you do check-ins you were saying with whole foods of of kind of shout outs to people or maybe talk about that, that idea of how we appreciate our teams and bring that level of respect to those we work with as well. Yeah, I always say that if you're trying to bring more love into your organization, a good starting point to do that is through appreciations. And uh, Whole Foods, in our culture, we've been doing this for decades, we end every one of our meetings with appreciations. Appreciations are voluntary, nobody has to do it. And there's no pressure to do it. But in an appreciation, you're basically thanking somebody, you're appreciating somebody for something they've done for you or something you like about them or something that um, inspires you. And if you do that in an authentic way, a couple of amazing things happen. First of all, whoever has been appreciated is gonna think differently about you. It's yep. like, if they might think, you know, I didn't, you know, I always kind of, I never really warmed up to John before. I didn't think he even knew who I was or, you know, and there he just gave me this most amazing appreciation. And he, he said some, and he did it in a public way. And I feel differently about him. I mean, I think, I think he's an okay guy. I actually really like him. Uh, it's very hard to continue to dislike somebody who's just publicly appreciated you authentically. Keyword is authentic because people can tell when you're blowing smoke and you're just bullshitting. But if you're doing authentic appreciation, they feel the love behind it. But even more importantly is the person doing the appreciating because it's impossible to do an authentic appreciation without opening your heart up. And cool. people feel that and you feel it yourself. So the appreciator is gaining as much or more than the person receiving the appreciation. So what else ends up happening in Whole Foods, I'll tell you, I can talk about my leadership team. We used to just do unlimited appreciations. And we had to stop that, I don't know, five years ago or so, because sometimes they just go on Meeting with on, men. <laughs> on. Yes, exactly. And it was like, we got to get some work done too. So then we limited it to just three appreciations. We did yep. that for a couple of years. But recently we say, you know what? We're just going to do one appreciation. So all you can do is one appreciation. So make it count. Make, yep. it, make it a really good appreciation. We've actually found that works the best of all. That's great. Well, it also adds a level of potency to it as well. Which it is does. Great. You've got to pick and choose and, and make it count. You're right. So, 
So, so like we've, we've covered kind of getting your teams together and how you're providing that level of leadership and compassion and understanding your team. I love the phrase, and I'm going to start using it, this idea of win, win, win. So I want to dive into that a little bit because you go pretty extensively. Um, it's such a great follow up to the ideas around integrity and honesty. Um, you say they encourage win, win, win opportunities, encourage us to at least our creative minds and develop more deeply innovative solutions. And it's that extra push. So talk about what, what is a win, win, win basically. Yeah, I mean, I am so turned on by win, win, win that I think okay. my next book is going to be all about win, win, win. <laughs> because most people do not have a win, win, win framework. It's the standard framework in life is generally win, lose or lose, win. We think if somebody's winning, somebody else is losing. If somebody's getting rich, somebody else is getting poor or poorer. Um, and we just have this binary sort of way we think about reality, the way we structure, the way we see things is in, the, in, the, in that way. And what I've learned about win-win-win, well, let me explain what a win-win-win is. A win-win yeah. is it would be good for you, Erwin, and be good for me. Yep. But a win-win-win is good for you, good for me, and good for the larger community, however we might define that community. It could be the team, it could be uh, our family, it could be uh, people in America, it could be people in the world, it could be the entire, the good, what's good, good for the planet, a win for the planet. Yep. So uh, the reason why that's important is you and I could make a deal. Uh, I, could, you could, I could sell you something that uh, uh, created a short-term benefit for you and then you threw it into the river and it polluted mm -hmm. the river. So that wouldn't be that wouldn't be a win win win. Yeah. Wouldn't, that wouldn't be good for the environment, good for the larger community. So, in a win win win, we're looking for you win, I win, we all win, and that third win is key to it. It's very critical to it if you're going to get a win win win. And what makes this so powerful, and I'll tell you how I I really started thinking in terms of win 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 in a second. Win 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 is almost a complete ethical system. If you began to live and, and said, my new ethical system is gonna be, I'm, every situation I find myself, I'm looking for a win, win, win. Mm -hmm. Your life would completely transform itself. First of all, you become extremely popular because everybody you're interacting with, you're trying to help them win. You're trying to help them be more successful. Yeah. And you, you will develop a reputation as a really, really good person. And people will like you and they'll gravitate to, towards you. Um, but you're not making a big sacrifice. It's not a, it's not a philosophy of altruism, although sometimes you can sacrifice because if, if, you, if, if, you, if you do this from love, people might sacrifice for their children or their family. They don't even think of it as a sacrifice. It's just what they're doing, what they wanna do. So it is a win for them, even if it seems to be a loss because they're voluntarily doing it. And the, the, the health or well-being of their children or somebody they really love, their significant other, outweighs whatever loss they might be experiencing. So even in that situation, altruism is accounted for as well. Um, it pretty much works in almost any situation if you start to think about it. So I, I got keyed into win, 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 actually through business and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Because the normal way people frame up business, just to be sure, is it's, the purpose of business is to just maximize profits and it's, they frame it up as a, as a cutthroat game or it's a win lose game. And there can't be any love in business because you know, it's cutthroat. It's yeah. not possible. Check it at the door. And in win, 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 how can you have a win, win, win? Because you're just trying to make more money. It doesn't matter if the other person loses as long as you get your win, but that's not really the way business works. I mean, it, there are exceptions to that. There are ruthless sociopaths in business, just like they are everywhere. So I'm not saying nobody ever does bad stuff. But if we take an example like Whole Foods, we have a, a series of stakeholders. And, and basically, if we think through each of our stakeholders, our company is looking for the stakeholder to win. So we want our customers, we want them to feel good, that the food they're eating tastes good, that it's good for them, that it's at a price they're willing to pay, that they think is fair, that it's beautiful. And that's why they shop at our stores, because they're 
voluntarily exchanging their money with us and they're getting a win and we're getting a win. That's a win-win yep. customer. Same thing with our team members. Nobody's forced to work at Whole Foods. They work here for our company because at this time it's the best job they can find at, at this rate of pay that we're paying with this type of working conditions. And if they don't like it, they can leave or they can go work somewhere else or find another job they like better. And in fact, every day, some people do quit Whole Foods and go find another job they like better somewhere else. But as long as they're working there, they're winning. That's why they're there. It's, uh, they're, getting, they're getting paid, they're getting benefits, they're getting opportunities to be promoted, advance, um, all the things that Whole Foods does for them. Suppliers, we have tens of thousands of suppliers. They're all trading with us voluntarily. They're all winning or they wouldn't be exchanging with us. We're winning from getting those goods that we can sell to our, our team members can stick on the shelves and we can sell to our, our customers. Amazon's winning, they're, they're the owners now, but before then we were a public company and we had thousands and thousands of shareholders and they were winning because Whole Foods created great value in the 25 years we were a public company. Our communities are winning because we're, we're not only very philanthropic and supporting food banks and local, local nonprofits, but we're paying taxes, we are, uh, we're trying to be good citizens in each community that we're in. Win, 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 win. There's five stakeholder groups. Every one of those stakeholders is winning. And I realize most people don't think about business that way because yep. all sports and all games, right? There's a winner and there's usually a lot of losers. Yep. So people think business has got to be the same way, but it's different there's not a bunch of losers. There's a bunch of winners. All these different stakeholders are winning. And I started thinking, that's not just a win-win, that's a win-win-win. And then I started working its way through and I started to think, my God, this is so applicable. If you start thinking this way, and, and that's how I think about business. That's how I think about when I'm coming up with business strategies, one of the things I do or when, is I think through it and I think, who's losing? Are any of our stakeholders losing with this? Because People have a tendency to think in terms of trade-offs. One stakeholder is winning, so somebody else must be losing. They have that win-lose really cuts deep in the way people structure their reality. But if you're looking for the strategies where nobody's losing, and if somebody's losing, it's a bad strategy, you begin to release your creative mind to come up with solutions that otherwise it would never come up with. You're like giving it permission to move in a different way. And I can almost always find win-win-win solutions to problems. And think about how important this would be right now in America, where we're, we're, we, we're at our throats, there's all this political divisiveness, we're having protests, we have riots, we've got a lot of fires going, we've got this election cycle we're in, and we're probably the most divided we've been since the Civil War. It's very bizarre. I don't see a lot of conscious leaders out there thinking win, win, win. And what's the higher ground of America? How can we find ways for all of the major stakeholders, all of our citizens, for everybody to win, to everybody to, to be upward and onward. And we, we just don't have leaders trying to think about how to do that. And I think we desperately need that framework to begin to be the way we think about, about everything in America. Win, 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 let's do it. Yeah, I, I mean, so well said and, and needed to be said. The other part that is um, inspirational is I think this will resonate this book for a whole different generation. We might be talking to leaders you know, 50 and up or other leaders. But when you look generationally to millennials and Gen Z, and I got three sons, their, their interests are much more around how can I help the culture? How can I help a small business? They, they're not buying, you know, they're not buying clothes off the rack. They're buying from someone who they want to know where it came from. Everyone wants to know that story. So there's a much more conscientious generation that thinks that way, that thinks they play the Minecraft games because they're collaborative building games. They're not shooting each other. You know, so I think there's hope for us. I want to put that out there, but we're in times that are absolutely, you can't read this book without thinking of the times we're in because you talk about um, honesty, integrity, telling the truth, generationally coming from that era where I grew up, where you saw an airplane pilot or a teacher and you stiffen your back and you wave to them and you know, you, you knew they meant to do the right thing. So hopefully we'll get there and people understand that. I do. Th I have great hope that this, this book will have an appeal to the, as you say, the, the millennials and Generation Z. They, Generation Z, by the way, will eventually get their own name. They, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They all start with bad names. 
Um, so let me get into I have a few things. You know, you talk about, I'll just mention it right here. It did change my perspective. You talked about the world, the whirlwind courtship, as you call it, with mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos and Amazon and how well that went. And also just to end this segment, it really seems to me like it was a win-win-win. Um, it changed my view reading those 10 pages or so. It changed my perspective on how I think things went down. For this interview, is there anything you want to share in a snapshot to say, this is why it was such a good fit of what you both culturally built over the years that suddenly went together like a... Well, you know, the metaphor that I use to describe it, it's, it's like a marriage. A big merger is like a marriage. And uh, it's a marriage because, A, you, if, if you get married, you're going to change. You just will. It's just what happens. You grow differently. You're growing together. You have a shared self. And you know what? The people that don't change in a marriage don't stay married. They get divorced. And so Whole Foods is evolving. And Amazon is, 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 is changing us, but they're not trying to change us. They're not trying to change who we are. They're just, Whole Foods is learning some new things from being, being working with Amazon that are, that are, I think, making us a better company and help changing us in constructive ways. Um, that doesn't mean everything, it doesn't mean we like everything about Amazon. I'm, and I, I love about 99.9% .9 of everything about my wife, but you know, there are little things that bug me and I'm sure there's, I don't have that good of a hit rate with her. I think I'd probably bug her more than she bugs me, but and I, so Whole Foods doesn't That's love pretty good rate, 99 .9 pretty good rate. That, was, that was pretty good rate. Yeah. I've raised it to 99.9 yeah. .9 because Sorry. my wife, I just last night, she said, what's this, what's the 1%? Yeah. What's the 1% you don't know, like about me? I want to hear about that. It's like, I don't want to talk about the 1%. I'll talk about the 99%. No, I want to hear about the 1%. So I've got it. I've, I had to increase it to 99.9% .9 so that uh, she'll feel better when I tell her I've raised you to 99.9%. Um, I don't know if Amazon has that good of a hit rate with yeah. Whole Foods, but we still have a very high hit rate. We, yeah. we still really like most things about them. Um, and, and so we are changing and we are evolving. But the thing about the merger is that it was a win-win-win. It was good for every one of the major stakeholders. And just real quickly, our customers, we've had three major price reductions since the merger occurred and we have a fourth one uh, that we're, we're, we're starting now or underway right now doing it. Um, we could never have done, with the, the COVID pandemic, our online deliveries tripled in the last year. There's no way Whole Foods could have done that without Amazon. It, right. we, everything would have fallen apart. We couldn't have done it. Um, and so they're helping us with technology. That's, that's a win for our customers. Uh, our team members, one of the first things Amazon did after the merger was they, they announced that we're going to increase the starting wages of everybody that works for this company to $15 an hour. And so if you were making $15 an hour, if you're working, making $13, you got to raise to 15. If you're making 15, we couldn't leave you at 15. We had to increase you because so it, it had this ratchet effect and, uh, about 90,000 people got increases in pay at Whole Foods, and that was due to the merger, ultimately. Um, uh, our suppliers gained. We didn't stop dealing with local suppliers, but now a lot of those guys were able to get onto Amazon's online platform or to their, their company, Amazon Fresh. So our suppliers gained as a result of the merger. Um, our investors gained. The, the market value of Whole Foods in the sale went up $4 billion from what it was pre-merger. Pre and our communities have gained. Our philanthropy hasn't changed and Amazon has supported our foundations. They've encouraged us to continue to donate to food banks and to local nonprofits. So the community stakeholders have been gaining. All the stakeholders have won at Whole Foods and that's what makes it a win, win, win uh, merger. That's great. Um, okay, we're gonna do three more subjects as we start to round up pretty soon. I wanna talk about innovation and then I wanna get to sleep and spirituality towards the end. Um, you have this great word, <laughs> um, innovationism. I loved it. You got to get it into the vocabulary instead of capitalism. Um, like so many, innovation is such an overused word is in the industry, especially for mine, for design or architecture. But you really elevate this as this call to adventure, as Joseph Campbell called it. Um, tell us about this, because I, I mean, if we could, if we could make that the word we we go towards, it has such a different taste in your mouth than capitalism. Sort of like it's not doggy dog. Do you, do you know who came up with the name capitalism? Uh, probably St um, uh, um, Lenin, uh, was it uh, Marx? Good guess, Karl Marx. Okay, second guess, good, thank you. Yeah, Karl Marx, the greatest enemy of capitalism, yep. gave it its name. So that's all you really need to know. It's not a good yeah. name, because yeah. it's not all about capital. Yep. 
the real key thing about the economic system, a free market economic system is innovation. I mean, it's been, it's been innovation that has changed our world so mm -hmm. remarkably, tremendously. I mean, and it's changing it even as we speak. I mean, hey, I am, when I was a kid, the TVs had just been invented. I mean, and there were three black and white fuzzy channels. And, yep. uh, and, and now people hardly even use TVs anymore because you can stream everything and watch it on your phone. I mean, smartphones didn't even exist, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, it's, it's astounding. Um, things like, I just think about in my lifetime, the things that didn't exist that have changed my life, starting with uh, Google. Yep. Google didn't exist. It's only about 22 or 23. Encyclopedia years. Britannica, 1971 edition. We still I, had, I used to have, the, I did my homework assignments looking at the Encyclopedia of course. Britannica. Exactly. The human body with those clear pages, yeah. Exactly. So uh, the internet was in develop. Google, uh, Amazon, Apple. Um, these are companies that have completely changed our lives. Netflix. Uh, um, you could go on and on and on and on and on. Um, the companies that are changing our lives at Microsoft. Um, innovation. They piled innovation upon innovation upon innovation. And that, that changes the world that we know. Um, Tesla right now is changing the way we think about automobiles. And when we have self-driving cars, mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years from now, people may stop buying automobiles. They may just be able to summon a self-driving car to take them wherever they want to go. And uh, they don't, they'll just have their phone and it'll know who they are when they check into the car and then they get off with everyone and it's just the bills on your phone. And why do you have to own a car? I mean, you probably won't, particularly if you're living in an urban area, you don't have to pay for parking and all the services that are on it. So that's being done through innovation, right. innovation. And so that's why that's a better name for capitalism. Yeah, no, you're right. It's about innovation and innovationism. And if actually think if people called it innovationism, it would be less hated, right? Yeah, it would, it would have this nice Epcot ring to it and very, it's very aspirational. I loved it, so I, I will start using that word. So one other one, and it's a dilemma we find ourselves and we started with a bit of this question, but. This whole idea of how you grow oneself creatively. I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I'm an architect and a designer in that realm, but I make guitars, I make animations, I do other things to keep my mind going for sure. Um, so it was in the chapter, Innovation Loves Company. You quote Fred Turner as saying, ideas live less in the minds of individuals than in, the, than in the interaction of communities. I am such a big proponent and believer of, when I'm not doing architecture, I don't care about architecture. I'm just not thinking about it. I'm thinking about films and food and all these kind of things. So. We find ourselves last six months, maybe six months more and more, we're in these worlds where we're separate from all of this. What are ways we could get people inspired to connect with those communities? Because that's, it's the coffee shops when you're sitting there with a friend that you come up with a great idea, not when you're doing a spreadsheet on Zoom, I can tell you. You know, it's kind of funny. I, I read an article fairly recently that said, if we hadn't had the internet and we didn't have Zoom, and we didn't have all these Netflix and Prime Video and all these ways we could stream movies to ourselves. Yeah. We never would have had a lockdown because humans never would have tolerated it. They would have, yeah. they didn't, they would have been bored on, there were no sports and uh, uh, they wouldn't. So in some sense, it's kind of that, that the argument was being made there that we would have broken out of jail, so to speak, much sooner. And, uh, uh, COVID would have spread, but humans, we'd have been more careful. Because when, like when I was a kid, I'm older than you. Yeah. When I was a child, pol there was no polio vaccination. Yeah. And I had a lot of schoolmate friends who got polio, who had a little shrunken leg or a shrunken arm, some that died from it. And so mothers were terrified in the 50s and early 60s about polio. And so if there was a polio outbreak and they heard of one, we'd get locked up in the house for a few days, but then when we go crazy and then they'd start to carefully let us out again until they had the vaccination. And I remember we all lined up for a sugar cube in these long lines. And that's how I got my polio vaccination back whatever year that was invented because it went, went out pretty quickly. So people used to respond to these viruses and these illnesses by just, you know, being more careful. And in this, lockdown situation with COVID, we didn't really do that. We, we, because I think we were, we had all these other things we could do in our homes that didn't used to not be able to be there for us. It, it, so human beings reacted to it a little bit differently. I just find that kind of, 
of kind of interesting. And now I've lost my, I was tying that back to your question. What right, your, you tie, you, I mean, the issue is, well, it's this disconnected nature of how we're yes. all living. How do we bring back that mentality of tying us together? Yeah, and the answer right. is, we would never have disconnected in the first place if we didn't have the means to, to at least somehow stay in touch. You and I are communicating yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but what's gonna happen is we're gonna go post COVID, right? I mean, the virus, like all viruses, humans have been dealing with viruses for hundreds of thousands of years. We've evolved with viruses and we will, we're adapting to this and it'll be, we still have the flu virus from two, 1918 and 1919 and it still kills some people every year, but mostly we're adapted to it. And I haven't had the flu in over 30 years. So um, no, knock on wood there. <laughs> in Asia, exactly. Yes, exactly. So um, we have to connect with people. We are very tribal and you're using it also in the context, it's the creative communities where mm -hmm. like the, the, we know that like, rock and roll took off in London with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And there was for, it was, that was really kind of, I don't want to call it the birthplace of rock and roll, but they had a very creative community yeah. in the early sixties there, or you had Paris for art in the 1890s say, or Silicon Valley today with all the technology innovations that have occurred there. People spark each other. And one of the things we tried to call out to people is there, the media and people tend to romanticize the genius and uh, the Stephen Jobs, the Elon Musk, the mm -hmm. Bill Gates, the Jeff Bezos is as if these giants and these guys are all brilliant people somehow or another invented it all by themselves, but they didn't. They were inspired by the people around them, the teams they put together. In a lot of ways, they were co-creations and they were partly from the, the overall network that people hang out in. So it's very good. And you know, you're talking about your own creative communities. I love to be in a creative community of like-minded people that yep. share my values because they're constantly sparking me. It's like my neurons are connecting up in a new way. It's like, I never thought of that before. And then I start working through the implications and I'll say something and that'll, that'll trigger somebody else. And, you, and you're, so you're constantly sparking each other and that makes us collectively far more intelligent. And books do that to a certain extent, but there's nothing like being in a community of like-minded people. Yeah. There's, there's well, a yeah, okay. intelligence. Yeah, I do one last question I hear, yeah. and I'll tie the two together, because you just, that level of energy is exactly what I think exudes from, I, I'm from the era of, uh, you work your ass off, you work hard, you work harder and harder, sleep is for pussies, you know, it's this kind of logic too. And then I hit this age where I started TM a few years ago, I did some Ayurvedic courses, and basically, we, are, we have a competition, my wife and I, to get to bed by 10 and be up at 6. We get eight hours every night, and we don't miss it, really. Um, and so I understand the importance of that. And also, spiritually growing oneself. Hard to cover that in the last five minutes of our interview, I know. But talk about this, because I think you bring that component in for a reason. It's, it's very clear, John, throughout your whole book, you care about those issues. You talk about compassion, love. I had a dear Buddhist friend, Gary Shandling, who was lived that life too of compassion and love and praise for other people and other people I've known who live that way too. So it's clear you know all about this. So if you can share some thoughts on this and why, if not sleep, spirituality is important to bring to your whole being as you work with others. Well, chapter eight in the book is, re is revitalize yourself. And yeah. you know, one of the best things that ever happened for me, my sleep was getting an Apple watch that has a, uh, it has a sleep app on it. So I track my sleep every day and I'm looking at it. I look how long I sleep. I look at the quality of sleep. I look at how, how deep I slept. I can track it over time. I find that if I have any alcohol, my sleep, I don't go as deep. I don't sleep as long. So now I'm like drinking less alcohol because I'm trying to get my sleep better. Um, yeah. And, and so sleep is very important. It's how we revitalize ourselves. It, it's how we, it actually sparks our brains, our bodies, everything. It's also how it strengthens the immune system. So we talk about not just sleep, but meditation. We talk about diet, movement. Um, there's so many different ways to revitalize ourselves. Just going out in nature is inherently revitalizing because nature is beautiful. We feel it and it, 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 it touches our souls in a deeper level. And the very last chapter in the book is about, it could be the, the title for the whole book, which is continuously learn and grow. We, yep. think of, we think of learning and growing as something children do, and they do do it. And then we think, you know, at last I got out of college or 
I got a PhD or whatever, and it's like, I'm finally done learning. I'm done. <laughs> but it's the, the best way to live, one of the best ways to live, is to just view your entire life as, as an opportunity to just keep learning, learning, mm -hmm. learning. Learn new skills, learn new languages, learn new people. Because people teach us more than anything else. Relationships have been my biggest teacher. Um, my wife is a skilled teacher of me because she's a, she, I'm a major project for her yeah. to make better. Uh, and, but my friends are the same way and we should just adopt an attitude. It's like, as long as we're learning and growing, life is an adventure, it's fun. Because every time I learn something new, that gets me excited. It's like, when I learn, my world gets bigger. Love it gets that. bigger. And what generally happens as you age is you start to lose things, right? You're, you're, you can't do some of the things you could do when you're younger. So many people experience getting older as your world shrinking in on you. The best way to counteract that shrinking is by learning and growing. And then, you're, and then your world's expanding again. Uh, you know, the, sometime in the next few years, I'm going to retire from Whole Foods. And you know, the main thing that's going to drive me to retire I just have other things I want to learn and grow, and I want more time for it. Um, thank you so much, John. It was great reading your book. I think it's going to provide a lot of inspiration to people from everything from understanding business, understanding yourself, uh, bringing that compassion and intensity that you have for life to others is going to mean a lot right now. And it's, it's sort of the perfect timing for a book, actually, for a book like this. So thanks for talking to me today. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. I enjoyed it, too, Erwin. I wish you the very best. and. Uh... Hope we get to meet in person. Me too. Thanks again to both of you. Thanks uh, for joining us. Appreciate uh, Irvin, Irwin doing the interview. John's book again is Conscious Leadership, Elevating Humanity Through Business, and it is available wherever books are sold. Thanks and take care.